Okay, so back to everybody. We're going to get started here. Um, I know I'm a little bit early today, but we're uh, got a little cross, uh, what do I say, crossfire uh, on my responsibilities this week. So I'm going to do this live stream um, on Nech Lecha, and then I'm going to scamper off to our congregation for Oneg. <clears throat> okay. And we'll probably be doing the same time period next week. Um, you know, and what we might want to look at is, I don't really know, uh, I can probably check, but how many of you enjoy doing this live versus a recording? And if a recording is more convenient, then um, we, we don't have to do it live. It's um, something that we started during COVID because it gave us something closer to a real connection uh, rather than just recording things and putting them out there, which is, you know, cheaper than a dime a dozen nowadays. Uh, but just to have that human connection on Shabbat. And if that's still useful for you, please let us know. And if you say, you know what, a recording really would be a lot easier. Um, even though you can watch the recording anytime, even if you watch the live stream, you can still pull up the recording. But just in terms of, you know, convenience, timing, relevance, usefulness, all those sorts of things, just, just let us know. Um, because, you know, it, it does matter sometimes what else I'm doing on Shabbat as to how easy it is to do that uh, four o'clock Eastern or to move it to 1.30. And I want to make sure this is something that's desired. And if it's desired, we'll keep doing it, definitely. Uh, but just kind of give us some feedback on there and we'll, we'll know what to do from there. Um, or if we'll just keep doing what we're doing. Okay. Um, all right. So let's uh, get started here. And of course, our, our Torah portion today is Lech Lecha. Lech lecha. It's kind of an odd turn of phrase, even in Hebrew. It's like, go for yourself. Um, so many times we do things for other people, for the benefit of other people. Um, but there comes a point in your relationship with the Holy One where this is something you have to do for yourself. You have to understand it yourself. You have to perceive it yourself. You can't do that for other people. You know, there's some things you can do for other people. There's help you can, can lend to other people, but especially when it pertains to walking the land of Israel and understanding the ancient covenant and how you as an individual relate to that covenant, it's one of those things you want to be completely present in the moment. You want to go for yourself, not for anyone else. Uh, because if, if you're grounded in it yourself, then you'll be able to stand through the trials and tribulations. Uh, and, and a lot of those trials and tribulations, you're going to feel like you're completely alone in the world, that there's nobody who understands you. There's nobody who who really gets you. Um, you're going to have questions of the Holy One. Like, is this really where you intended to bring me today? You're going to have those moments. And to prepare yourself for those moments, you really need to take that opportunity to go for yourself. There's something in the land to do that's going to bring you completely into a friendship. That's the difference in the relationship. He called Abraham a friend. It's going to bring you into a friendship with the Holy One. And so many times we'll, we'll not stick with a stranger or an acquaintance when things get a little, you know, they rock a little bit, they get a little bit out of balance or, you know, there might be a little offense here or there. If it's a total stranger or just an acquaintance, somebody we're not really committed to, we move on. But if it's a friend, if it's a family member, often we will linger and give second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth and ninth and tenth and 70 chances, right? And this is the, the, the degree of friendship you want with the Holy One. Not that you're asking for that many chances, but sometimes you need to give the Holy One that many chances, it's so hard to understand his plan sometimes. I think of Abraham, he and, and Sarah, all the things they went through. How many times during that period do you think they, they questioned within themselves? Did we really hear from him? 
does he really like us? Is, is, I mean, he brought us here because he likes us. You're going to have those same moments like they did. But if you can go for yourself, lech lecha, develop that friendship with him, then, then you'll stick with him, even in the places where you're, you're thinking, I don't understand at all what you're doing with me right now, but I'm going to hang in there because we're friends. We're friends. We have lots of relationships with the Holy One, a king, a father, a sovereign, uh, a healer. A provider. There's so many, you know, all the names that he has, they describe to us different relationships we can have. But we were children of Abraham. We want to be his friends. We want him to call us friend. And there is a way that we can develop that friendship. It's a way of developing faith. And Lech Lecha is going to describe to us exactly how we develop that friendship. Okay, and so I'm going to call this frankincense, myrrh, and the great gift return. I know most of us have, have gotten gifts before. Maybe they didn't fit, weren't the right thing, and we had to return them. Uh, well, there's something similar going on. Out here among the nations, there is a people, and they don't quite fit where they are. They've been put where they are on purpose, but nevertheless, where they are, they, they're, they're just not fitting in. And so they're, they're going to have to be returned. They're going to have to be returned uh, to their rightful place. And that's what we want to look at today. So let's take a look at one of the texts from the Torah portion. This is Genesis 5, 5 through 7. And as I read through a few of these passages, see if you see something in common. And so he took Abraham outside and said, now, look toward the heavens and count the stars if you were able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Then he, Abraham, believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am Yodhevafe, who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. So I know that passage is quoted at least three times in the New Testament. He believed Adonai, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Faith is one of those things we may not have done everything that we'll be called to do yet, but yet we believe and we will follow because we believe he is able to complete in us and perfect in us the work that he has started. And so we get credited for righteousness we haven't even done yet. And this is what Yeshua extends to us. He extends to us his righteousness. Even as we're still learning how to walk in it, it's still put onto our account because the same way we have faith in him, he's extending credit, faith to us, that we will walk in his righteousness. And the point of this, remember the stars represent, in some cases, not in every case, in some cases, the stars represent the descendants of Abraham, of which you should be one. Are you saved? Have you made a proclamation of faith in Yeshua as the Messiah? Are you walking in his word? Then you're a descendant of Abraham. You're walking in the faith of Abraham. You believed the gospel, and the rest of the works were credited to your account as righteousness, even as you're learning to walk in them. And so ultimately, what is this promise about? It's about descendants. And he says, I'm bringing you out of Ur. I'm bringing you out of the, the nation where you were born. And I'm giving you this land to possess it. I'm transplanting you. I'm giving you a new address. And so the, the focus of Lech Lecha is for you to understand the land. Understand the land. What are you supposed to do when you go to Israel? Understand the land. What are you supposed to do when you read the word? Part of it, understand the land. Know who you are and understand the land. And so where it says he believed, the, the word there um, in its context, it, context is going to be vehet amin, vehet amin. Um, the, the Shoresh, 
is going to be Aman. Aman, believed. He believed. Aman. You may have heard that song, Anime Amin. Anime Amin. It's a song about Mashiach. It's, I believe, I believe, I believe. If you're a female, you say, Anime Amina. Anime Amina. I believe. If you're a child of Abraham, learn to say, Anime Amin or Anime Amina. It's your emuna, that would be the noun, your faith. Emuna, faith, the verb aman. Right? So faith is connected to understanding the land, that it is a possession for the descendants of Abraham. Okay? Now, this is a longer passage. This is from Genesis 17, 1 through 8. And it says, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face. And God said to him, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. So twice he names the multitude of nations. So we know that as we're understanding the covenant, part of the covenant is Abraham will have lots of descendants, as many as the stars, and they will become a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations. There it is. And kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And here it comes again. I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, is promised to Abraham's descendants as an everlasting possession. Well, we know that that's been a little off and on um, through the last few thousand years. Remember, it's conditional upon the covenant. Um, living in the land is conditional upon an agreement to and a commitment to a faithfulness to the covenant. That's part of it. That's what it means to be a descendant of Abraham. So twice here we see the land as a possession is part of this agreement. So Genesis uh, 13, 17, this is important. He says, arise, walk about the land through its length and breadth, for I will give it to you. Right. So this land was specifically given to Abraham and his descendants. Right. Now, we could trace that. We could go down through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so forth. That's not what I want to do today. What I want us to do is to understand the relationship of the nations to the descendants of Abraham. You say, well, aren't they one and the same? Because he was promised that they would be Come a multitude of nations. It would be kings in those nations descended from him. True. But even though it might be a hidden work, it's hidden. It's not apparent that many kings of the nations have descended from Abraham, even though it's possible and even probable. Knowing how human beings mingle and so forth, it's entirely possible that there's descendants of Abraham sitting on throne somewhere. But I suspect that in the millennial reign, when King Messiah rules and reigns from Jerusalem and he dispatches his faithful out into the nations to proclaim the word and to set up his rulership in the nations, I suspect that's when maybe most of the descendants of Abraham will have those recognized titles, say, as a king or a ruler over a nation, because they're there to tutor, to coach, to teach the Torah and the word, going out from Jerusalem to the nations. 
So there are nations, and they're the descendants of Abraham who were promised a specific piece of land. And that's what all the trouble's about right now, a specific piece of land. And who is thought to be um, the rightful inheritors? And who is pro you know, claiming to be rightful inheritors? So let's take a little bit from the Haftorah portion. Isaiah 41, 1, and then we're going to skip down to verse 8. It says, listen to me in silence, O coastlands. Remember, there's a silence of about half an hour in the book of Revelation. It might be related to this. Listen to me in silence, O coastlands. Let the peoples renew their strength. Let them approach. Let them speak. Let us together draw near for judgment. All right? I don't know who would even want to do that. Who would want to approach the Holy One and say, judge me now? But he's inviting them. Come on, let's have judgment now. You all want to talk about my people. You all want to talk about my land. There will come a point where he will say, shut up and come here. We're going to have a judgment. And we will see after that judgment who you think my people and my land are for. So let's go down to verse eight. He says, but you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, right? We might say that Israel, for a couple thousand years, they, <laughs> kind of like when we're kids, we get sent to the corner to sit in a chair and think about our behavior or to stand in the corner and think about our behavior until we're uh, sufficiently repentant that we can join the family again. This is that on a bigger scale, <laughs> much bigger scale. So he says, I, I scatter the descendants of Abraham out to the farthest corners of the earth, but you're still my servants. I've not cast you off. I'm with you no matter where you are, and I will strengthen you. And, you know, as we go on through Isaiah, we realize he intends to keep his promise. He's going to bring them back to this land. But I want to look at who the, co the coastlands are. Sometimes we'll read a word and we'll just keep reading because like, I don't really know what it's talking about. Is it talking about the beach or what? Well, these coastlands are challenged. Approach for judgment. Come here. He says, I want to talk to you. So let's go to the first mention. What is a coastland? Because he's contrasting the coastlands with his own people. Their place with his place. The place of the nations with the place of the descendants of Abraham. So it's kind of a weird word. It's E. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like the, the city of I in the scripture. Like, who picked that particular uh, name out? Because it's so short, you could confuse it with a lot of things. So like, I, E, this is E. Uh, Eim is going to be the plural, coastlands, Eim. So E is a coast um, or a country. That's the thing to remember. It doesn't have to be uh, an island, which is how it's sometimes translated. It can be a country. It can just be dry land. Uh, it can be an island. So the, the E-im, um, let's look and see if we can get a better idea with this challenge to the coastline. Is he, is he talking about an island? Or is he talking about something much bigger? So again, we go to the first mention of the coastlands. Let's go to Genesis 10.5. It says, from these coastlands, these Eim of the nations were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. So these Eim, who were being invited for judgment and being contrasted with the apportionment of the descendants of Abraham, 
we can see in its first mention, what are we supposed to understand about the coastlands? The Iim. Basically, that it's the nations of the earth, according to their language, their families, their clans, they have an assigned place. They were separated into their lands, and that's their assigned location. Those are the nation's assignments. Here's been the historic problem. Since Genesis 10.5, they've not necessarily um, respected their assignments. And they've certainly not respected other people's assignments. It's, it's been an age of total war since the creation. And then again, since the flood. The problem is the EM, the coastlands, they want to reassign the borders. And one thing they want to do is they want to absorb the descendants of Abraham. They want to assimilate them in and make them just like them. Number one, that's not their authority to do. It's not their authority to redraw the boundaries. And it's certainly not under their authority to try to absorb the children of Abraham and make them just like them. Where all are equal, each has an assigned uh, role. And if you want to be called a descendant of Abraham, there's a requirement. And we read that. We read that in just the little samples that we read. You have to accept the covenant. You have to be part of the covenant people. And part of being the covenant people is understanding there is a covenant land that is separate from the coastlands. Because this land is going to be characterized by obedience to the covenant. It's a high level of holiness compared to what's going on, on out in the coastlands. That's why these coastlands are having the Torah and the word taken out to them. And that's why they're having to come up in the millennial reign, say at the Feast of Sukkot, for further instruction. They're learning obedience to the covenant. They're not in that 100% um, engaged in the covenant. doesn't mean they can't be. Right now, they certainly aren't. But in the millennial reign, there's going to be a change of heart. And they're going to, those who have been offended by, those who have ridiculed the covenant, those who have tried to restructure the covenant, uh, those who have tried to stamp out the covenant, in the judgments with the coastlands, these folks are going to be filtered. And what's going to be left are those who, it says, did not go up against Jerusalem to make war against it. Now they're ready to hear. If they weren't ready to hear before, now they will be. So there's a people, there's a covenant, and there's a specific land. And it's not an outer space. It's a specific land with specific boundaries. And those boundaries might be a little bit different in different time periods, uh, but they're there. So in the Messianic reign, that thousand years, the nations will retain their assigned territories. I suspect that the, the modern boundary lines of civilization that we're familiar with, the way that our globes look when we spin them around, I suspect those boundaries are going to be redrawn. And the boundaries that were set after the flood, like we read, he says, okay, this is your territory, this is your language, this is your people. I have a suspicion they're going to revert back to that. It, it could redraw a lot of things in the world. Uh, how is that possible after all the mixing and conquering and wiping out? And I don't know. I don't know. Maybe there won't be that many people left in the world at that time. Um, not, there won't be enough left to argue about it, probably. Wherever Messiah wants to draw it. I suspect he'll go right back to the scripture, right back to the word. And so we say, okay, you're telling me the descendants of Abraham, they have a specific land that is associated with living under the covenant. But you say, I don't think I can trace my, my ancestry literally back to Abraham. I don't know. Well, we get lost in there. Maybe I did some DNA. Maybe there's a possibility there was, there was a Jew somewhere in my background. That's not important. Because Galatians 3.29 explains it. It says, if, remember, this is a conditional phrase, if and then. 
there's criteria. And if you belong to Messiah, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. Now, this is written to the Galatians. The fellowship, presumably, they are not Jewish by descent. But he's telling them, you also, if you belong to Messiah, he's the, he was the door that you came through to become a child of Abraham. And to this day, when there's conversions to Judaism, the convert is referred to as a son of Abraham or a daughter of Sarah. They take on Abraham and Sarah as their parents. Okay. <clears throat> and then the short form, you're all familiar with this scripture, Ezekiel 47, 21 through 23. It says, so you shall divide this land among yourselves according to the tribes of Israel. And this is in the millennial reign. You shall divide it by lot for an inheritance among yourselves and among the aliens who stay in your midst, who bring forth sons in your midst. And they shall be to you as the native born among the sons of Israel. They shall be allotted an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. And in the tribe with which the alien stays, there you shall give him his inheritance, declares the Lord God. So Ezekiel envisions in the millennial reign that there will be lots of people who will have joined themselves to the covenant. It says they're bringing, uh, they're bringing up sons of Israel. What does that mean? They're producing the fruit of the word. They're passing this fruit of the word along. It's, it's transforming them. And he says, these are also entitled to an inheritance in the land. In fact, he says, give him his inheritance as though it's understood that he can inherit in the land, right? You, and he doesn't have to belong to a specific tribe. He can simply choose one, settle down, and he's going to receive an inheritance, right? So how do we get back? Right now, it's a big mess. How do we get back? We know how some people get back. And again, it's by bloodline. But this route into the land is thought to be prophesied in the Song of Songs because we know there's lots of people out there who are going to be included who may not have a pedigree. And according to the Song of Songs prophecy and, and some other uh, passages of prophecy, it's going to be the same route from the north that was taken by Avram when he journeyed to the land of Canaan from Haran, or Haran. So from Haran, which is going to be in the north, to the north of Israel, what we're going to see in the text, his journeys took him to the mountain of myrrh and frankincense. As he journeys down, he, in the end, ends up on Mount Moriah. We know that he took tithes to the, the king of Shalem, Malkitzedek, and then later he takes Isaac. To Mount Moriah. This is considered the mountain of myrrh and frankincense because, of course, the myrrh and the frankincense were offered in the temple services later. And then in the time of the 12 tribes, as they were camping in the wilderness, remember Bilam was hired to curse them and he couldn't. Instead, he gets one of the most beautiful prophecies in the Torah and in the Bible itself. He sees them encamped. And he says, how lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your tabernacles, Israel. And so there's a song called Matovu, how lovely. We, we sing that each week in Shabbat service. It's a prophecy of return. Because in that prophecy, Bilam saw Israel with all their blemishes that we know they had up to that point and continued having uh, till they reached the end of that 40 years. He looks at them. And he sees this gift. He sees this sacrifice without a blemish. He sees a people dwelling in perfection. Okay. So as we work through the, the prophecy, and we'll read the passage too, so you'll know what I'm even talking about at this point. But we know that uh, Mount Hermon, and Sinir, and sometimes it's pronounced Shinir, may be the same mountain. Remember, these are up in the north. Um, remember, Mount Hermon is the one that has the snow 
up on its peak. You can kind of baby ski up there in the wintertime. But both of these mountain ranges are part of the, the northern range of mountains that border pre-millennial Israel, right? That mountain range is called Torres Amanas. And you can even hear in the Latin, um, the, the mountain of uh, Amman, right? Uh, but that's, oops, wait, here's the passage. Now this will, this will make more sense. It says, until the cool of the day, when the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. And that's thought to allude to the Temple Mount. And here's what he says. You are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no blemish in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. May you come with me from Lebanon. Journey down from the summit of Amman, from the summit of Sinir and Hermon, from the dens of leopards, from the mountains of leopards. Now, there's a lot to unpack here, so we're not going to be able to do all of it, but we're going to give it a try. Okay, let's focus on just verse 8 here, uh, Song of Songs 4, 8. He says, come with me from Lebanon, my bride. May you come with me from Lebanon. Journey down from the summit of Amana, from the summit of Sinir and Hermon, from the dens of lions, from the mountains of leopards. Right? So um, the, the mountains mentioned there are Amana, Sinir, Hermon. And it's a place of lions and leopards, which should sound familiar, right? So when he says, journey down with me, my beloved, the bridegroom's calling to the beloved. He says, journey down with me, which is Tashuri, Tashuri. Um, it's very similar to our Torah portion. Abraham is told, lech lecha. In, in other words, come on, get up and walk for yourself. Walk around, start inspecting it, Abraham because your offspring are going to possess this land. So you need to walk and take a look. It's a similar command here, Tashuri. Shur is, it says it's identical with the uh, idea of going around for inspection. It means to spy out, to survey. And it can be to uh, lurk around, to survey something for evil or for good, to care for something to lay in wait, to look, to observe, to perceive, in other words, to understand. We say, okay, they're being told, Israel is being told to journey down. They're supposed to come across these mountains. And of course, we know the destination is Jerusalem. The destination is the land of Israel itself. So Tashuri, the, the root of it being Shur, which means to, to inspect it observe it. Let's go again to the first mention, and that'll put us, that'll give us a good GPS. What does he mean, journey down with me, observe with me, survey with me, understand with me? Well, it goes right back to that passage we just talked about, where Bilam was called to curse the 12 tribes, and instead all he can do is bless them. And so it, it it wouldn't hurt if you read the whole passage there in Numbers 24, because the, there's beautiful specifics about it. But I just want to focus here on this um, observation of Israel uh, as journeying down. I, I want to find out how are they going to get back? We see as they're encamped here, they're preparing to go in. How can we prepare? to go in? How can we see what Bilam saw? How can we see that perfection? When sometimes we definitely don't feel perfect. Well, Numbers 23, 9, Bilam said, as I see him from the top of the rocks, and I look at him from the hills. Okay, there's that word again. Uh, sure, which is to observe, to regard, to understand. I look at him from the hills. Behold, a people who dwells apart and will not be reckoned among the nations. 
In other words, they have their assigned territory. The coastlands have their assigned territory, but this is a people, these 12 tribes dwell apart from the nations. Their territory is not like any other nation. Right? And here's what he says about Israel in Numbers 23, 21. Remember, he's looking at Israel, and this is very close, because remember, the, the song says, you are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no blemish in you. Well, it's hard to imagine the children of Israel returning without any blemish. But here's what he says. He has not observed iniquity in Jacob nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him. That's exactly what was promised to Abraham. I'll be with you. And it says, and the shout of a king is among them. So how is that going to be accomplished? Bilam can't see any iniquity or wickedness in the tribes of Israel as they're, they're camped, preparing to go in. How are they going to accomplish that being a beautiful darling without a blemish. Well, the clue is in the text. He says, the shout of a king is among them. It is the work of this king that's going to be vital to their achieving this perfection. And what does he tell us about King Messiah? Well, as we go to verse 17, Numbers 24, 17, it says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, there's our word again, sure, I observe, I perceive, I understand, I spy out. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel and shall crush through the forehead of Moab and tear down all the sons of Shaped. So he refers to him as a star and a scepter, right? He's a star. Uh, again, the descendants of Abraham were called stars. So he will come from a tribe of Jacob. We know he came from the tribe of Judah. And it says a scepter. So there's a royalty associated with this King Messiah. He has a scepter of authority. And of course, we know the, the kingship was assigned to the tribe of Judah. That's what joins these two things. So, again, let's keep looking for the word. Sure. To observe, to inspect, to lurk. Well, there's a, a kind of ominous prophecy to Israel when they're misbehaving, when they're getting ready to be driven out of the land. Hosea 13.7 says, So I will be like a lion to them, like a leopard. I will lie in wait by the wayside. So rather than this being a positive thing, where it's the observing Israel in a state of righteousness and beauty, when they start following after other gods, he says, okay, the lion and the leopard that are always lurking around trying to devour them, I'm going to be like that. That's how I'm going to observe them. I'm going to lie in wait. And I'm going to uh, judge them. But it's also proof where it says to lie in wait. In the context of their exile, it's also proof that they are still under observation. Remember, he says, I will be with you. Even out there in those nations, I will be with you. So even though Adonai sent them away for idolatry, he's still lurking to redeem them from exile. He's always waiting to redeem them from exile. And if you'll remember all the lessons we had on the four winds and the four beast kingdoms and so forth, we know that the first beast kingdom was the lion of Babylon. And we know there was the bear of Persia, Medea. Finally, the leopard of Greece. And then Rome adopts all of those abominations and perfects them. And eventually the, the iron legs of Rome go down into the iron and clay feet that are standing on the world today. That influence has spread all over the world today. So whereas the beast kingdoms were lurking to try to absorb Israel and redraw their boundaries, nevertheless, the Holy One 
he's also lurking. He's trying to redeem them, bring them back, and set their boundaries again to defend those boundaries on their behalf. But it has to be connected with repentance. Return is attached to repentance. So let's look again here at these mountains and hills of Lebanon that he's describing as the route that the returnees are going to take. So Hosea, again, uh, and this is going to be chapter 14, verses 4 through 8. He says, I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely, for my anger has been turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. Remember, dew can stand for resurrection. He will blossom like the lily, and he will take root like the cedars of Lebanon. His shoots will sprout, and his beauty will be like the olive tree, and his fragrance like the cedars of Lebanon. All right, this in the context, it's speaking of the transformation of Israel. When they are healed from their apostasy, they are going to have the qualities of Lebanon, the cedars of Lebanon, the fragrance of Lebanon. Those who live in his shadow will again raise grain, and they will blossom like the vine. His renown will be like the wine of Lebanon. In other words, those who attach themselves to Israel, they will prosper. O Ephraim, what more have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. There's our word again. Sure. I'm observing you. I'm watching you. I'm lurking to bring you back. If you will repent and put away your idols, I will bring you back. He says, I am like a luxuriant cypress, also from Lebanon. From me comes your fruit. So that's a, another beautiful use of this, I'm lurking to look after you. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it, but the Holy One is always watching and lurking. If we will repent, if we will put away our idols, he starts the process of bringing us back and making us beautiful and perfect. So this symbolism of Lebanon, if we are supposed to come through Lebanon, the question might be, does he mean literal Lebanon? Or is he talking about the principles of Lebanon that he teaches us in scripture? So let's just look at some of the symbolism of Lebanon. It can refer to the temple. Because remember, the bones of the temple, the, the timbers were made from the cedars of Lebanon. And in the millennial reign, Lebanon is um, actually part of Israel itself. The borders extend pretty far north. Uh, if you kind of compare it with a modern map, you can see how far north. But the, the territory of Dan will go much higher in the, the millennial reign. We know that Lebanon or Haran, um, it was a testing place. Uh, Jacob had to go to the land of Levan, and it was a place of exile for testing. And then he brought his 11 sons plus one, <laughs> I guess, in the oven, uh, brings him back to the land from the land of the north. It can also relate to the pride of nations because it's related to the height of the cedars. And so it can be a good thing or a bad thing. You know, the, the beauty of Adonai and serving him can be like the height of the cedars in Lebanon. But it's, remember, the nations are always trying to put themselves in that place because of pride, which is a, a negative aspect. It can also allude to very Eden-like beauty and pleasure. Those are some of the, the contextual uh, symbols of Lebanon, right? Um, we also know that in that mountain range we're talking about, that at this point divides uh, the northern border of Israel from Syria and Lebanon, that we have Mount Hermon there, and those mountain ranges where snows as they melt, will flow into the Galilee. The rains will go into the Galilee and it will uh, water the length. It will stretch the length of the land of Israel all the way down to the Dead Sea. So it's giving life to the entire 
uh, tribal territories, we might say. Um, also, if uh, you've ever had a, never had a chance to read or watch the teaching on Luz and Beit El as the spring uh, from which the, the waters begin to flow into the Galilee. Uh, it's over that border in Lebanon, modern Lebanon, right over that border, but in the millennial reign, it will be part of the boundaries of Israel. But that mountain range is significant because so much of the water runoff again, is going to flow into the Galilee. And remember, Galilee of the Nations is one of the nicknames of the Galilee. So we know even though in Ezekiel's vision that Israel's holdings will extend all the way to the river Euphrates in the east, the passage we're reading that's discussing how these descendants of Abraham will return, it focuses on Lebanon. It focuses on the north, we might say. And again, those ancient boundaries, uh, Haran, Aram, Lebanon, uh, Tyr, Sidon, which were city-states, these things are going to kind of blur together in prophecy. But as we're looking at that general area in the north, the sages say, you know, from a scholarly standpoint, those mountains would be considered north and west. And uh, it's also the area from which Avram retrieved Lot, which we're particularly interested in right now because he got the hostages back. Baruch Hashem, he retrieved the hostages. Uh, but when the kings took away the hostages that they kidnapped, they ran up north into this area and Avram arms himself and his men and they go after them. And it says they pursued them all the way as far as the territory of Dan. And if you remember in the wilderness, it was Don who held the banner of those three tribes in the northern encampment. All right, so I'm just going to remind you something. It might have been a year or so ago, but when we were doing the Four Winds study, we talked about what is the significance of the four directions. And one of the, the expectations is that Messiah is thought to be hidden in the north. North is Tzaphon. Safon also means hidden. And so the, the rabbis say Messiah is hidden in the north. Right? It's, it's a way of saying Messiah is hidden right now. Well, where are these people going to come from? They're going to come from the north. So in essence, they're hidden with Messiah. And then they say that the divine presence, and we know the divine presence is everywhere, but we're talking about that special, you know, that what we were talking about, I'm lurking. I'm observing you. I'm hovering over you, watching you. The divine presence is thought to be concealed in the West with the exiles. They said the exiles went West. And so he sent his presence after them to watch over them, kind of to, to lurk and to wait for their repentance, to see if Ephraim would put away their idols. So you put those two symbols together, North and West. And so you have a people who are hidden with Messiah, and the divine presence is lurking. Um, it's also concealed, but it's watching over them in order to bring them home. So are we talking about they're literally coming over those mountains, or will the, the gate be opened through some action that occurs in those mountains? That's the question. I don't know the answer. We, this is, we're on a wait-and-see basis right now. So let's look at this mountain. The peak of Amana is thought to refer to Abraham because he was the beginning of our covenant faith. Remember, faith is Emuna. And in the Messianic times, it's thought to be referencing the return of Abraham's exiled children back to the kingdom of King Messiah. So in the same way that Abraham's emunah was accounted to him as righteousness, it's also going to be reckoned to his descendants. Right? Because, and this again is quoted often, even in the New Testament, uh, Habakkuk, Chavkuk, 2.4, it says, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous 
will live by his faith. In other words, his soul, we often say our, our soul is saved. What's actually going on? The word Yeshua is in a, a constant process of saving our souls. This is, you know, the, the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. So there's a salvation that goes on at the beginning, but then there is this blemish free bride that if we continue to walk in the righteousness of Yeshua, if we continue to live by our faith, then at the end of the journey, that perfection, that beauty, that being without blemish, that demonstration of our emuna, we live by our faith. And whose faith is that? It's the faith in the righteousness of Yeshua, not in our own. So the play on word there with the mana is, you could say it also means her faith. Whose faith? Well, Abraham's children, the daughters of Israel, the daughters of Jerusalem that are spoken of in the Song of Songs. They are going to return to the peak of their faith. It's, it's referred to like when it, when it says the peak, it's Rosh, the peak of the mountain, Rosh, the head of her faith. Well, who is the head of our faith? That star of Jacob, King Messiah. It's through the work of King Messiah that Abraham's children are going to be able to walk in her faith, that they're going to be able to cross these peaks and return to the land. So let's look at Matthew 2, 10 through 12. I think this is an incredible uh, connection. I think I want to do a little bit more with this eventually, but it helps us to understand these three particular gifts that the wise men brought to Yeshua and his mother. It says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Miriam, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped him. They know he's a king. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. So they see the star rise from Jacob, the King Messiah. They know he will hold the scepter, that he is the king, which, of course, is not sitting so well with King Herod. What does the gold represent? Remember Exodus 28, 11 that the names of the 12 tribes were etched into stones and then set in gold filigree on the shoulders of the high priest. So the tribes are in settings of gold. What else is going on here? Remember, return with me from the mountain of frankincense and myrrh. Our, our, our destination is the Temple Mount. Remember, the, the incense represented the prayers of the righteous. And then thirdly, Herod was going to be a problem here. We know eventually Herod was responsible for the slaughter of the boys in, in, Bethlehem, in Bethlehem. Herod was a double Edomite. He was descended, he was an Edomian. He was from Edom. And they were the products of forced conversion. But he's also joined himself. Remember, Edom in modern times is thought to be Rome. I mean, that's the, the traditional way of looking at it. And so he was both an Edomian and he's working within the Red Roman B system. And so he knew he was double trouble. And he had to get rid of this King Messiah because all the prophecies. I mean, keep go back, keep reading Isaiah, Ezekiel. Messiah is going to destroy Edom. Who is this coming from Botsra with his garment dyed in blood? King Messiah. He's going to destroy Edom. He's going to destroy the beast, the red beast. Uh, and there's no doubt about it. So again, here's our text. And maybe some of this will make more sense now. Come with me, Tashuri, journey down, lurk, <laughs> observe from Lebanon, my bride. May you come with me from Lebanon. Journey down, come down from your, your exile. 
journey down from the summit, from the head of a mana, from the, the origins of your faith, from the summit of Sinir and Khirman, from the dens of lions, from the mountains of lepers, get out of those beast kingdoms that are trying to absorb you and redraw the boundaries. And this come with me being said twice is thought to refer to the Holy One saying to Israel, come with me. Uh, you, you're not listening to me. You've fallen into idolatry. Come with me to Babylon. And the lion beast of Babylon, he was with them. And they've been in exile pretty much ever since. Um, you know, a short period of success and then back into exile. And so even though Israel was exiled into the kingdoms of the beast, Adonai was with her. And so we can see how Lebanon is the metaphor for the temple in that context. That, yeah, come with me. Come to Babylon. And then in the second great exile, the diaspora, he will still be with her. Come with me, come with me. He's still with her. But he's also bidding us to come with him back to the temple. It's come with me, return from the beast kingdoms, come from the lion, come from the bear, come from the leopard. And what are those? That's that Roman conglomerate beast that Daniel saw. It's all those. It's, it's one beast. It's one idol. It's one figure that Nebuchadnezzar saw. And that beast extends around the whole world. So in the places of their exile, they are going to reach a summit of emuna. They're going to reach a summit of faith in their exile. And they're going to begin to prepare to return to their inheritance and to a rebuilt temple. <clears throat> now, Mount Hermon is a snow-covered peak. What could that mean, that we're, we're going to come through Hermon? Well, we know snow can be a symbol of purity, yes. But it can also uh, be a symbol of tribulation or judgment, like the leprosy, it would say it was, and it was white as snow. So is it going to be judgment and tribulation? Or is it going to be a transformation of purity? It's going to repent, depend upon repentance. Job 38, 22 and 23. Have you entered the storehouses of snow? Or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of distress, for the day of war and battle? So the snow on Mount Hermon, as we look at the snow, as beautiful as it is, it can represent a day of war and battle. And we know right now that this is where the enemy is dug in, just on the other side, lobbing the rockets in. And if you did the Wars of Kings with me, and you went through the 10 plagues and the 10 siege tactics, you go back through this week's news and see if you can say, there it is, there it is, there it is. I mean, it's like you can just fill in with the news, the, the different uh, tactics that are being used. But what Hermon is suggesting is that there's going to be a purified, faith-filled Israel. And they are going to return at a time that is associated with extreme judgment, a time of war, and a time of divinely imposed diseases. Should sound familiar. And so the Midrash specifically states that the return to the temple in the time of redemption is going to be in three hours after the end of the Roman exile, which we're still in, by the way. Remember the Roman beast, it's still all over the world through the, the organizations that it has spread. And they say, what do we mean by three hours? They say, this means it's going to happen quickly. Don't read it as three literal hours. Read it as meaning something that happens quickly. So here's what the Midrash says. In three hours, in other words, very quickly, the Holy One, blessed is he, will exact punishment from the wicked Isa, Edom, and his chieftains. Adonai will, number one, arise from the ashes of the temple, from his holy throne above. And this is so weird. Um, one of the examples they gave in this Midrash, which I didn't put it on the slide, because I thought, well, that's just too odd. To tell people about we'll just you know you know <laughs> go to number two after that but they said the holy one 
since the temple was destroyed has been like a chicken, like a, like a hen covered with ash. And the same way that a hen will stand up and shake her feathers off and throw off the ashes, this is what he's going to do when he arises. When he arises to take vengeance for his people, it'll be like a hen throwing off the ashes. And yesterday, as I was watching some footage, there was a place that had been bombed and sitting right down there in the middle of that dust and concrete ash was a chicken doing that exact thing, shaking the feathers to get the ashes off of her. I thought, now how coincidental is that? Um, but the idea is that because his people were exiled from the temple, he's been in mourning with them. Again, he's, he's lurking to do us good. He's lurking, observing, journeying around to see, is it time to bring them back? Is it time to arise from the ashes of the destroyed temple? And that process is basically, um, he stands up from the holy throne above. Uh, second thing he will do, once he stands up and kind of, like the, the picture we're supposed to get, because he's a spirit, we can't say he looks like a chicken, all right? That's not what we're saying. We're saying it's the kind of the principle of standing up and just shaking off everything that's settled over the last 2,000 years. And then he will ascend, his authority will be made manifest, and he will punish the nations with judgments, which goes back to the coastlands. He's saying, come over here. We're, we're going to have a judgment now, and we'll see, have you redrawn the lines? And then the third thing that will happen, the third, quote unquote, hour, he will be exalted in all the earth. All the nations will have to acknowledge him. And of course, Edom, Edom, Esau, is part of this judgment. We know that Edom helped Babylon destroy the first temple. You can read Psalm 137, 7. You can read Amos 111. Edom, Esau helped destroy the first temple. They destroyed the second temple. Remember, the, the sages see modern Esau, Edom as Rome. And they have oppressed Israel throughout the period of their exile. Remember, the, the Roman system is all over the world now through its organizations. And in every generation, they try to destroy the people blur the boundaries, assimilate, absorb. And it says for these three things, Edom will be punished in three hours. In other words, Edom will be punished very quickly. And that's why I think Herod is associated with these, what the gifts that these three wise men brought to Yeshua. He was the prototype of this Edomite Roman because he was literally an Edomian and he's a Roman. He's a Roman governor. He's riding that beast, and it's that red beast. And weirdly, he was known for enhancing the building of the second temple, but at the very same time, murdering thousands of pious Jews and contributing to the graft in the temple. It's like he could do two things simultaneously. So we know that this fraudulent Jew, this Idumean, King Herod, he was the product of a forced conversion. If we follow the history back, his heart wasn't in the Torah. His heart was in Rome. The temple was just something for him to bring glory to himself. And when he was faced with the true king, when he was faced with the star of Jacob, he was a threat to Herod in every way. because. Herod didn't have faith. He didn't have faithfulness. He didn't have the bloodline. He wasn't holy. He didn't have spiritual authority. He knew that by prophecy, his people were going to be destroyed. So why were these three gifts such a threat? And remember, these astronomers, they come from the east. Well, Herod knew that the return of Israel with her king Messiah is going to be a great gift return from the nations. 
They were exiled into the nations, which was actually a gift to the nations because they would be blessed. Remember, I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. There is a blessing upon the descendants of Abraham. Didn't feel it that way, but there is a blessing. And so when they return, they're still a gift. And what was said is the nations of the earth, because the prophets say that the nations of the world are going to bring the 12 tribes of Israel from the lands of their exile. They say they're going to bring these people as gifts to King Messiah. That these people will literally become their gifts to bring to the new ruler of the world. So they're going to return. Israel, the descendants of Abraham, they're going to return to the mountain of frankincense and myrrh. That's that symbol of their pure prayers. Why is it important to pray today? Because it's, it's offering up the incense. You're preparing to take your place on the temple mount. And remember the gold. That we will be carried on the shoulders of the high priest in those gold settings, will be part of his new government. And that's what shoulders represent often in scripture. It represents government and bearing the burden. So even as we are born on the shoulders of King Messiah, we become part of that government that bears the burden of the world, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Those three gifts told Herod that the means by which the exiles would be restored to their land and holiness, that the true king was present. I see him, but not near, right? He, he came and then he left, but he'll be back. There's nothing Herod was doing on the Temple Mount or in Jerusalem that could rival that gold, frankincense, and myrrh because it represented the tribes, the descendants of Abraham returning to a specific place. And would that threaten Herod? You bet, because remember, he's also a Roman beast. Roman's not going to, Rome is not going to give up Israel, not without a fight. And so he was worried that his government was about to be deposed by the authentic king of kings, the star of Jacob, the scepter of the Holy One from the tribe of Judah. So why would this gift be brought by wise strangers? Well, that's another meaning for that word. Tashuri, journey with me, journey down with me. It's like gift. You're a gift with me. And these wise strangers brought these specific gifts. So where are they getting the Tashuri journey down is related to a gift. 1 Samuel 9, 7, Saul said to his servant, behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is gone from our sack, and there is no present, no teshura, to bring to the man of God. What do we have? So in this case, a gift is teshura. And the man, Saul, who is the future King Shaul, He's saying, you know what? There's nothing we have that is a gift great enough to bring to a prophet. What gift can we bring to a prophet? Well, this is the, the message that was very important to Herod. As he, he knows they've got gold, frankincense, and myrrh, that they're bringing the symbols of the exiles to their future king, who is going to say, come with me and be a gift. The nations will return them. You say, well, how am I going to get to Jerusalem? Well, here's what Isaiah 66, 18 says. For I know their works and their thoughts. The time is coming to gather all nations and tongues. Remember the coastlands according to your people and your tongue. And they shall come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them and will send survivors from them to the nations. Tarshish, Put, Lud, Meshech, Tuval, and Yavan to the distant coastlands that have neither heard my fame 
nor seen my glory. And they will declare my glory among the nations. Then they shall bring all your brethren from all the nations as a grain offering to the Lord on horses and chariots and litters, on mules and on camels, to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, says the Lord, just as the sons of Israel bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord. In a clean vessel. Remember, there's no wickedness in Jacob. There's no blemish. There's no blemish in you. And so rather than using their chariots and horses, in other words, their war vehicles, to chase Israel around and attack them, these wise nations are going to convert those war vehicles to carry the descendants of Abraham to King Messiah. Rather than using their camels and mules, which were commercial transport, to enlarge Babylon, they're going to reappropriate them to carry Israel as gifts to the house of Adonai. Because see, these wise nations, they don't have a proper gift for Adonai. They don't have a proper gift for King Messiah. What are you going to take to the prophet? The only proper gift they can bring to Yeshua is to return their purified, faith-filled people. These are the descendants of Abraham. Abraham, remember, he is the Rosh. He is the head of your Emunah. And so those who sing, and there's going to be another meaning of Tashuri. You hear Shir for song? Tashuri. They sing the song of the sea after the war chariots of Pharaoh were destroyed. And so what's going to happen? There are going to be war vehicles that pursue Israel to destroy them completely, to erase their boundaries. But there are going to be wise nations that once they understand, they're going to convert their war vehicles. They're going to convert their commercial transportation to return the descendants of Abraham's as, Abraham as gifts to King Messiah. They're going to be returning from the north. They've been hidden with Messiah. And they're going to come through the mountain of Emuna. They're going to come through the growth of their faith. They're going to come through the holiness of Mount Hermon. Because Israel, they are still the people. And Israel is still the land. It hasn't changed. That's why nothing makes sense right now. Israel is the people who know what is written in the ancient covenant. Israel is the people who live by the ancient covenant. And what they need now is their land to live that ancient covenant. How will they all get home? Different ways. Different ways. How does this relate to the resurrection? Not exactly sure. I don't have a timeline. I'm not that smart. I just know that this is a way of explaining to us part of that return. And so let Edom, let the red beast, let the nations of the red beast be warned. Ezekiel 36, 5. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, surely in the fire of my jealousy, I have spoken against the rest of the nations and against all Edom who appropriated my land for themselves as a possession with wholehearted joy and with scorn of soul to drive it out for a prey. They've been warned. They've been warned. But Israel is the gift that is going to be sent home, carried home, drawn home. Adonai is lurking and looking for opportunities to bring us back and to stand against those who are speaking against the Holy One, his eternal promises to the descendants of Abraham, 
And the land is part of that covenant. That land is part of the agreement. It's non-negotiable. What do we know? Isaiah 9, 6 says, a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. And the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The government of King Messiah is coming. The footsteps of Messiah are coming. Is it our generation? Or is this a preparatory generation? Is this a generation where people will start to come through the quote unquote north, the hidden north, where they will begin to trickle home? Is it the next generation or is it the next? I don't know. But every generation must think of it as if this is the generation. Every generation must examine themselves for idols and faithlessness and say, what do I need that will identify me as a descendant of Abraham? Receiving the message of Messiah Yeshua. Walking in his righteousness and his faithfulness so that we are prepared to live in a holy land. And remember, the rabbis say it'll come in three hours. In other words, quickly. The devastation of Edom, the red beast of the earth, and all the nations associated with that red beast, they will be destroyed quickly. And here's what Revelation 22 20 says He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Adon Yeshua. The grace of Adon Yeshua be with all. Amen. Twice. It says, Amen. We are going to come from the mountain of Amana. We are going to come with faith. That's how we're going to come through. The same way Father Abraham came through and journeyed down from those mountains, that's the way we're going to go in. And if you would like a couple of extra references to take a look at um, after class today, a really good passage is Isaiah 49, 18 through 23. It's another passage that describes how the nations will begin to bring the sons and daughters home. And uh, let's see. And this is from the Midrash. Just a couple of sources from the Midrash. Uh, you might take a screenshot or look at it later where they're commenting on uh, Tashuri, which is related to Singh, and how it goes back to watching the, the chariots of Pharaoh destroyed, and then they sang the Song of the Sea, and how this might be how it happens again. We are going to see the, the war vehicles, the war implements of the dragon. Remember, Pharaoh stands for the dragon, and then he gives his authority to the beast. Uh, so we'll begin to see those war implements destroyed, absolutely destroyed. And we will be able to say, uh, be able to sing as well, Tashuri. Uh, we'll be able to sing a song of redemption. Because it's, it's referencing, and they believed in the Lord. And Moses sang. They believed in his words and they sang his praise. And so there's some references there from uh, Hosea 2.28, Exodus 14.31 through 15.1, Psalm 106.12, and so forth. Those, those might be something you'd be interested in taking a look a little bit later. Okay. Uh, I know that was fast. It, was, it felt like I was talking 90 miles an hour. Uh, but um, I wanted to get the whole lesson in today, and then we can follow up a little bit next week and see if we can get a little bit more clarification on these footsteps of Messiah and how to prepare. That's the important thing. How do we prepare, right? Okay. And I'll take a, about 100 people. Well, that's, that's a lot of people. Okay. Uh, just let us know. 
but for now we don't plan on stopping it but if 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 it we, if there's ever a place we need to stop and just do a recording we're willing to do that too to make it easier on people okay we love you and Bazar Hashem I'll see you back uh next Shabbat at about the same time all right have a great week next week pray for the peace of Jerusalem pray offer that frankincense and myrrh be the gold uh, because wise men will be available to return us to our inheritance right I'm looking forward to that I, I, I would love to get first class one time <laughs> love you guys bye-bye